Hello traders, it's Saturday, September the 21st. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up for the past 24 hours and total week of trading, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the full trading week ahead. Now, as always, when I consider fundamentals, I'm always looking for top prioritization, and oftentimes it's a carryover of the theme that was most prominent in the week that precedes, uh, or it's uh, isolated around high level event risk that we can say independently is going to have the greatest capacity to focus all of the market's attention. Well, we definitely do not have a clear consistency of a particular theme that we're carrying into the new trading week. I think that all... Uh, three of the majors, that's recession fears, trade war concerns, monetary policy, as well as a fourth, uh, the new floater is uh, geopolitical tensions, will all be present in the week ahead. And there is a certain amount of scheduled event risk that I think really applies itself to monetary policy and, and uh, recession fears, or just the general outlook for growth. Uh, but nothing is going to be consistent and everyone should remain on their toes. Now, considering the fundamental uncertainties, and I think that uh, this past week certainly has edged uh, that risk uh, particularly higher, you can actually see uh, a risk associated to some of these concerns, at least in the in the recession and the monetary policy terms, uh, in uh, Google Trends, which I've been looking at more regularly with you here. Uh, this is search interest in, well, the blue line uh, is recession. So recession fears. The green line is negative rates, uh, so monetary policy, which is also very similar to the yellow down here, which is stimulus. And the red is tariff. All right, so if I removed, let's say, recession, okay, you can see that uh, there's still greater concern, relatively speaking, uh, to historical uh, terms, uh, interest in all of these issues. But there is certainly a much uh, more principal uh, focus on the issues of recession, so growth concerns, and negative rates, which negative rates relative to stimulus. Stimulus usually has a positive connotation. Negative rates has a negative connotation uh, because people start to really question what the efficacy of the policy is and what it actually starts meaning for investors whose returns are related to these baseline rates. All right, so as you can see, there's a greater concern of the risks that are picking up going forward. And it's also worth uh, reminding that this particular month, September, is well known for trouble uh, in pure speculative assets like the S&P 500 you're, you're measuring here in historical standard. So this is the backdrop that we are dealing with, the market's anticipation, the recognition of fundamental problems, and yet the standing of these uh, speculative benchmarks. The S&P 500 U.S. equity index obviously is, is one. This is arguably the most persistent, um, hard-headed, if you will, uh, of the risk-leaning assets. It, it tends to lead all the other chief uh, speculative benchmarks that I like to compare but it is far from the only one that is actually still leaning positive and carrying a significant amount of premium relative to the risk that we face. This is all world equities. Uh, you can see it, it very much is at resistance, uh, much more great and a clear cut than even the S&P 500 in terms of the uh, recognition of that level. Uh, but then even things that are at a significantly lower uh, benchmark than its peak uh, early 2018, which is a, a general peak for most assets, uh, the emerging markets, the high yield, the uh, carry trade, all of these are still buoyant relative to where they've been in the previous months, uh, previous couple of months. So there is a certain amount of risk appetite priced into this market that is at risk that it can start to retreat if fundamental issues really start to uh, catch traction. So 
what are the themes that we need to be watching for in the week ahead and uh, what should we expect in practical terms the break to be on the S&P 500 and its proxies now I say S&P 500 it's just used as a, as a proxy for risk trends uh, you can apply that uh, risk insight into almost anything with a risk lean and it, though some may be subtle everything has an association to risk trends that's risk reward it is applicable to everything but in the fundamental terms i think the surprise uh, driver this past week uh, and certainly in the, in the final 48 hours of this past week was actually economic activity so the outlook for gdp uh, and the fear obviously of recession it was, if you were looking just purely at the economic calendar, quite clear that there would be a lot of interest, specifically in monetary policy, because the combination of the Fed rate decision, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, the Norges Bank, uh, uh, the Indonesian Bank, the, uh, the South African Bank, the Brazilian Central Bank, all, all hosted in a 24-hour period, it obviously scheduled a very clear and intense amount of influence that we would have to adapt to fairly quickly. But ultimately, this didn't prove the most uh, comprehensive and ongoing market moving theme, although I do think we have a lot of influence that will carry, for, uh, carry through going forward because there's a lot of uh, complacency built into the market that is principally funded uh, by the influence of monetary policy. You will hopefully recognize this chart. I use it now very regularly on purpose. The relationship of stimulus relative to the S&P 500, I could also flip upside down the aggregate uh, benchmark interest rate of the major central banks and place it against the S&P 500 and you're going to get the same thing. Uh, it is accommodation or monetary policy support and the appetite of speculative appetite or speculative interests. This is a temporary salve. It is a, 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 a bid that is based upon essentially front running a central bank, not looking for genuine opportunity. This is genuine opportunity. It's a very simplistic reading, uh, but in its simplicity, I think it's really indicative of the market, the expected rate of return in the open market versus the risk that's associated to the investments, risk reward. And you can see how divergent it is. How do we maintain such a di divergence from value? We have central banks or temporary uh, supports that cloud us to those uh, to that uh, discrepancy. All right. So monetary policy will carry through, and I'll talk about uh, what to look for in the next week in just a second. But first and foremost, I think that the most uh, pressing issue has proven through the end of the week to be just the general concern of growth. And it was really, uh, we had a number of indicators that really spoke to these issues, uh, second le secondary level indicators, surveys, um, polls. Uh, but what, what really drove it home is the OECD on Thursday updating its, its global growth forecast and its uh, individual regions and it downgrading global growth for 2019 to 2.9%, as we talked about yesterday and mentioned uh, across a number of uh, reports on it, anything below 3% previously was established by the IMF on a global basis uh, to be a sign of recession. So it's difficult to get our head wrapped around it, but 3% expansion in a global capacity is usually indicative of some growing, some contracting, uh, but not growing at a fast enough pace to carry the global markets forward. This is very much like China, if you will. Uh, China is not in a tangible recession, a rece uh, so economic struggle, simply when it turns into negative GDP. China would be in a recession in something far more robust, something that uh, I think most other countries, developed countries, would consider extraordinary growth, like 5%. South of 5%, China is starting to get into a, beyond a stall speed, it is in ser serious economic trouble. This is why we can't take the numbers on face value all the time, and why China is increasingly aggressive 
in its efforts to uh, essentially open uh, the country and its businesses uh, and try to stabilize trade relations, even though those don't seem to be very, going very well, which we'll talk about in a second as well. But that concern about global growth uh, was certainly front and center uh, to end out this past week. It wasn't just the OECD. Here's a 10-year, three-month yield curve. Uh, it wasn't just the OECD. It was uh, the New York Fed. Um, their GDP now actually was a impressive re rebound. Uh, so from a previous week's 1.6% forecast for quarter three GDP, uh, they raised it to 2.24. That's very impressive. Uh, that, that's a, a huge increase of about 0.6 percentage points. That doesn't, however, change the market's perspective of the health of the U.S. economy, because we had at the same time a Gallup poll. So Gallup conducts an economic confidence index uh, every month. And while plus 17, anything above zero is uh, indicative of more people responding in the favorable to the U.S. economy, uh, it was a significant drop from the 24, plus 24 in the previous month, and ultimately the lowest since January when we were just getting out of the government shutdown. Further, you break it down and you see what their concerns are. Uh, economists talking about the possibility of recession, and lo and behold, we're talking about the 10-year, three-month yield curve uh, that is construed by uh, economists as being a, a preferred measure of recession. And yes, it is in recession territory. That's why we saw such a spike in Google search uh, relative to recession, uh, principally because the market's paid so much attention suddenly to uh, what is otherwise very wonky in nature. But that was a contribution. Uh, trade wars, the slowing of uh, the growth and employment uh, trends. You would also see in their breakdown, 48% said the economy was getting worse in September. Uh, and for those that thought uh, uh, looked uh, forward to the possibility of recession, 15% said it was fairly likely, 34% said it was likely. All right, so you have good and bad indicators um, on the state of the economy, the global economy, uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, but overall, I don't think that there is a particularly strong bearing to suggest that we are, if you will, earning the highs that uh, the benchmarks like the S&P 500 have. In fact, I don't think we're earning the highs that we have from uh, relative assets that are in a much better position, like the rest of world equities, excluding the US, the VEU. I don't even think this is true to value. But a couple other things that we were seeing, it was the Fed's Clarita, um, uh, part of the governing board, uh, who suggested that the US economy was in good place, but uh, pointing out that it's in its 11th year of expansion and that's kind of mature and that there were certainly risks. I think that needs to be discussed more often so that practical assessment on risk reward and growth uh, to rebalance is thought through more thoroughly. Uh, we would also have an interesting uh, insight. So kind of follow up on the Gallup poll uh, from a a central banker from another country, the Philippines, uh, central bank governor, uh, Dionk, uh, Dionk, no, uh, who suggested, or was asked, what was the greatest risk to the global economy going forward? And he stated, uh, deadpan, Donald Trump, <laughs> which is not necessarily uh, difficult to understand why he would suggest this, considering the U.S. economy is the largest economy in the world and the policies uh, that he's uh, has uh, has driven essentially one of uh, growth at the expense of other countries or trade is one that really does throttle the world relative to this largest player. And it's trade wars, therefore, that, uh, that really start to gain significant traction in uh, the market's open fears. Whether you're talking about consumers or investors, uh, you can actually see this is my preferred index. Actually, uh, this is one of my frequent opening charts when I come back uh, from overnight and I'll open up my charts in the morning. Uh, one of the first ones that I open is USDC&H because I think this has a very good measure of the day-to-day -day 
improvement or deterioration in trade relations between the two countries that are at each other's throats, which is the United States and China. As you can see, we ended this past week in a upswing, and it closed Friday higher. Why? Well, trade war conditions actually did deteriorate further, even though we had the delegates uh, at the deputy, deputy level uh, for the United States and China meeting in Washington, D.C., and there was some um, uh, positive commentary. But ultimately, there were greater fixation, there was greater fixation on uh, the problems that started to arise rather than the benefits. Uh, China had insinuated that uh, it sees some of the moves by the United States as goodwill, uh, and it looked like uh, the efforts to kind of seed uh, an improvement in relationships by, the, by both of the countries was starting to get somewhere. And then President Trump came out and suggested that he wanted a complete deal with China and that agricultural purchases that they vowed was not enough. As aggressive as the, as the president is, this is not at all surprising. This is kind of his uh, status quo or his, his uh, position at, at the whole time. But it seems to have had a negative in, influence or assessment by uh, the Chinese because in turn, the Chinese trade delegation said uh, that uh, who were expected to visit uh, farms, I believe in Montana and Nebraska, uh, canceled their visit. And that could be taken as just, uh, oh, they, they ran out of time or uh, it just didn't work out. But it is a strong statement if you make these plans to try to be very clear in your intentions uh, that they cancel. All right, well, we'll to see what uh, comes of, of it over the weekend, uh, the time when we have no liquidity and markets are extremely exposed to repricing gaps on Monday. Uh, but we'll have to see the language and the status update that we get from, unfortunately, uh, the most uh, dramatic uh, mouthpieces for this. It is uh, Chinese state-sponsored media and the U.S. president uh, through Twitter. But keep tabs on this. There are, it should be reminded, other outlets for trade wars to continue to be conducted they haven't just they simply haven't erupted yet but actually the euro usd is a front for a potential trade war that i am particularly concerned about uh, donald trump's criticism of uh, the federal reserve for example actually didn't have an update in the 24 hours to the end of friday which was quite surprising uh, he did critique them obviously immediately after the rate decision to cut rates a second uh, meeting in a row uh, but Clearly, the president is very concerned about the level of the U.S. dollar because this appreciation of the, the local currency makes difficult his efforts to put, in his, his words, put America first. So essentially earn growth, again, at the expense of trade uh, with global counterparts because in the United States uh, goods become more expensive and foreign goods become cheaper with this exchange rate adjustment, which is naturally what you would expect to occur if the policies were actually working. Uh, but this is definitely going to draw out a very clear consternation from the president. It's already there. The question is whether he actually takes takes uh, efforts into his own hands? Will he try to find a solution uh, to adjust the currency outside of monetary policy? The pressure is immediate because he's trying to keep campaign promises, yet he's also trying to prevent a recession uh, that could be com uh, complicated by his efforts. And one of the few ways of doing that is actually to uh, earn an advantage in trade by means from which he's, he believes that many other countries are actually proceeding. So it's a strong incentive, uh, in essence, for him to pursue this. So trade wars uh, can also turn into currency wars, something that we should be very mindful of. Now, in terms of the theme that we were dealing with this past week, Euro USD, since we're already here, the euro advanced on the day that the ECB announced a rate cut, quantitative easing, and a tiered lending. All right, very unusual, but that uh, Thursday before last uh, did have a euro advance. And the Fed rate cut, no intention of further change in 2019, according to their own forecasts, uh, the dollar advances itself. 
unusual to say the least when you're looking at it from a superficial value, but when you look at it from a weekly perspective, when you consider it from the big picture, uh, it is definitely something that is being, uh, I think, uh, appropriately priced in the market. I showed this earlier. This is the dollar index, DXY dollar index. And what I did is I took the U.S. benchmark rate, and uh, this is 10-year, let's go down to weekly, 10-year, uh, and relative to or, or uh, subtracted from German, Japanese, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand, uh, UK yield. All right, so the US versus the rest of the world in terms of yield. As you can see, it continues to climb. So this is a concept that we've been talking about. While the Fed is cutting rates, and it's cut rates twice, relative to its counterparts who are essentially going to negative rates and uh, restarting QE in the case of the ECB already there in the Bank of Japan's case, uh, it's still maintaining the gap. And this is a complication that uh, we can see perhaps why the, the president is uh, irked and why the policy effort, uh, the policy adjustments aren't earning capital market gains. But this in itself is a problem. All right. We should not pursue monetary policy for anything other really than economic activity and financial stability. And yet monetary policy is increasingly being used or presumably used uh, for the purposes of lifting capital markets. So the S&P 500 again. Uh, it was Rosengren, one of the Fed uh, voters, who this past session suggested that rate cuts are not without their costs and that inflating prices uh, of risky assets was a, a fallout potential, which also in turn encouraged households and firms uh, to take on too much leverage. And, and in other words, the foundations of financial instability. Now, Rosengren's not the only person that has stated this, uh, either directly or indirectly. We've actually had a couple of other Fed officials suggest this. Uh, Esther George um, has definitely suggested it, and other central bankers around the world. But we need to see more of this consideration of the quote-unquote costs of accommodative monetary policy. All right, because we have... Essentially, central banks all adopting more easing to some extent or another. You know, the, the exception is the Norges Bank. Uh, but this is questionable in that what, it's, what is its objective? If the monetary policy is already failing to jumpstart or accelerate growth and is definitely not reaching inflation targets, then why do they continue to follow the same line to the same outcomes? It's the definition of insanity. And it's likely because they're hoping for changes in, in financial market response so that they can get the quote-unquote trickle-down trickle wealth effect, which is actually, uh, people say that the Fed isn't doing it for that purpose. Well, actually, the Fed in, uh, admitted as much uh, not long ago, back when Bernanke was uh, chairman, uh, saying that this was actually one of the objectives of their very accommodative monetary policy. And this is transparent on its face, uh, but central banks won't admit to it openly most of the time. But even if you fail to get the market, uh, the market appreciation or the asset appreciation, the currency depreciation, then what is the point? It increasingly uh, leverages up risk, but it fails at its underlying principal objective. And this creates a problem because once the markets, it's not just uh, they, and they create problems in terms of, let's say, the possible failure of uh, banking systems and having to can deal with negative rates, which is a major problem, but more so what happens when the global markets essentially no longer trust that uh, monetary policy is effective? Then this relationship that we've been looking at very often, I will continue to remind because this is an enormous risk, uh, that the lift that we got from stimulus is going to start to fall apart or it's no longer a prop to keep markets lifted. We have a serious problem because the look at value is an extreme divergence and there is a lot of room for this market to tumble. Now, in terms of monetary policy over the coming week, we have a lot of, uh, of particular or targeted uh, commentary. So 
ECB President Draghi is going to testify before the European Parliament on Monday. I'd say watch that fairly closely. Although his views, he's definitely concerned about uh, the limitations on monetary policy effectiveness. He's stated as such, uh, but he will soon be replaced by uh, Madame Lagarde, uh, former head of the, or still current, uh, head of the IMF, uh, soon to be the new president as of November. Uh, you'll have some Fed speakers, uh, but then you get into the BOJ governor, Kuroda, who will be speaking on Tuesday morning, the RBA governor speaking on Tuesday morning. Uh, the heavy impact from the Fed speak or the uh, global monetary policy speakers is Thursday, BOJ governor again. Kaplan and others, Bollard, I would watch him fairly closely. He was uh, one of the dissenters from his last rate decision, not because he uh, argued against a rate cut, but rather because he said they should go for 50 basis points worth the rate cuts. Uh, but then you're going to get uh, Draghi, Carney, and Cunliffe, uh, as well as Kashkari, Adov. Uh, you'll also have the Mexican central bank rate decision and the New Zealand central bank rate decision to contend with both important monetary policy events, but not global. We need to look at this as an overview. We have a number of high-level Fed officials and uh, governors of the Bank of England, the RBA, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank. Uh, collectively, they will really inform on monetary policy. If they all come with a particular view that monetary policy is starting to reach its limitations, I don't think the market is in a position to continue to ignore that warning. They could certainly become more and more concerned, especially when you can look back at uh, the health of the global economy and reinforce those issues, that, that realization. And we will talk about, uh, or we will get a good reading on global activity uh, because we have the PMIs that are due for Asia, Europe, and the US on Monday. The composite manufacturing and service uh, PMIs from market and uh, their various banks uh, for the month of September, first readings. Right. Good, comprehensive, timely GDP update. So very important here. Now, in terms of individual regions or currencies to watch for under this pressure uh, or under this uncertainty of event risk, I will be watching the dollar, uh, but I don't think that monetary policy individually or trade wars individually or even uh, GDP, uh, U.S. growth relative to the rest of the world, is going to individually or principally carry the, the views of the dollar. Uh, in essence, I think the technicals that you see here are very appropriate. And those technicals show we are in a wedge. So there's going to be a breakout. And I'm fairly uh, confident it's going to be a breakout in the force, uh, first 48 hours of trade. If you go down to a four-hour chart, you can see how tight this wedge is uh, here. And it essentially can go to the apex as of Thursday. But you're already seeing that the range that we have to work with is smaller than the 10-day, so two trading, uh, two trading weeks, uh, average true range. So it's very easy to force a break, but where do you break thereafter? You have a two plus year high uh, up here at early September, which we can move towards, or we can try to get down towards the bottom of this rising trend channel. But you're gonna expend a lot of momentum and conviction getting to the boundary, and then you would actually have to make the critical break uh, to determine a trend. That's a little bit too much for a market that is not clear on what its principal mover is. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's problematic to trade any other individual uh, across. EURUSD is probably better suited to that general perspective, uh, but if you take a look at something like the Aussie USD or Dollar CAD, uh, they can isolate uh, some of the more individualistic aspects, like Dollar Yen, for example, is probably going to carry more of a risk bearing uh, than most other dollar based crosses. Uh, one pair that I'd watch very closely, Kiwi USD, I, I've pointed this out, you can see we actually tumbled through this past week and it puts us to a new low. In fact, you can scroll back and wow, you go back for a very long time. Uh, so taking up to a weekly chart, you can see that we are the lowest we've been on this exchange rate since 2015. Take it up to a monthly chart and you can see that we are at a very significant level. 62 uh, in, in these terms is actually the combination of a range support going back to 2009 and a rising trend line, which is very loosely set. I usually require three separate points to call a trend line, but 
it roughly falls in scope with what you see here. So it reinforces 62. We clear 62, and that's a very big technical development. Uh, what can keep it going? Dollar advance is not as important. But again, the R, B, and Z rate decision can very much change the, the perspective of a currency that is typically considered a, res, a, a carry currency. It's involved in the majors principally because it's a carry currency, a high yielding or high dividend currency. Take that away and why would it be construed as being important? So keep this particular uh, currency pair in mind. And if you're looking at other Kiwi crosses, Aussie Kiwi is particularly interesting. Kiwi CAD is uh, tracking a lot of what the U.S. Uh, variant is looking at. Uh, you even have some interesting, well, pound, ki pound kiwi may not be the best, but you have some interesting uh, look and feel from the likes of the Euro kiwi or, and kiwi yen if you want to go for risk aversion and add, add that to the mix. All right. Now, other currencies that I will be watching and very mindful of, there's actually quite a bit of event risk for the euro, uh, but the euro is tied up, when you look at something like the EURUSD, with uh, cross current. There's too much fundamentals going on. And while investor sentiment, Eurozone activity, ECB president speaking are all very important, I don't think that they have proven themselves quite capable of generating clear and unalterated market movement. Uncertainty exists with the pound, but at least we know the score, so to speak. Uh, it's Brexit, Brexit uncertainty. And we haven't seen through the end of this week, at least by the time I recorded this video, an outcome from the Supreme Court for the UK's ruling on whether the suspension of Parliament was legal or not. But we are still watching very vigilantly what the situation is in Parliament being prorogued for five weeks which takes, essentially take it to mid-October. Uh, the warning this past week uh, from European leaders, particularly Finland and, uh, and fr France's leaders, saying that if there isn't a solution uh, to the backstop to be considered by EU leaders through, by the end of this month, they essentially consider the situation to be over and that it's essentially going to end in a no-deal outcome. So well before the October 31st deadline. Uh, this puts more pressure and certainly does not register well. It was, I think, Bank of New York Mellon, uh, BNY Mellon, who suggested that if there is a no-deal Brexit, uh, that the pound dollar can get down to parity. Uh, so parity for those uh, our, our tra currency traders is one. One pound of the dollar. And as you can see, we haven't been there in many decades. Uh, the same would be true of the euro pound. They see it getting to one dollar, or sorry, one euro, which isn't uh, very much further than what we had as the peak back in December 2008, but uh, it is still a significant depreciation for the sterling from where it stands now. All right. Now there are other interesting events and currency crosses out there. Uh, I, I will continue to watch the Euro Swiss because Swiss Franc is in a particularly uh, exposed fundamental position with monetary policy being so important. Uh, I will be watching the Australian dollar as it uh, has ties to trade wars and the RBA is kind of a contrast to the New Zealand dollar and the RBNZ, which is why I like watching the Aussie Kiwi. Uh, I will always be watching gold, especially considering its implications for financial stability. So risk aversion and financial instability. If both of those kicked in at the same time, gold would just soar. So this is a great, uh, if you want hedge, but just pure barometer uh, that you should keep in, in the rotation. And even crude oil should be watched closely. For technical purposes, when are we going to close this window is a question that I think many people have uh, with that gap that we had to open up the week. Uh, but also what the situation with geopolitical tensions between the issues uh, Again, it comes back to the United States and Iran because of the attacks on the Saudi Arabia oil production, which has supposedly come back online. I don't know how. Uh, it just happened at the beginning of the week or over the past weekend, uh, and already apparently the full capacity or virtually full capacity back up and running. Uh, but nevertheless, keep tabs on this because it's not just about oil. It's about global demand uh, and another facet uh, that could open up into a key driver geopolitical uh, risks and the threat of open military war.
We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets next week. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there and hope you have a great weekend.